Okay, we're going to be talking about gas centrifuges today, and there are some technical aspects that one needs to understand about how centrifuges operate. And there's going to be several different lectures, and they will focus on different aspects of how a gas centrifuge operates. So that's what we're doing today. Uh, gas centrifuges are used to separate isotopes, and isotopic mixtures have the same chemical characteristics, but different atomic characteristics. So for example, uranium is one of the most, most focused on uh, isotope that we're interested in for making p nuclear power reactors, for example. And so the, when you go out and mine uranium ore, then that ore is going to contain primarily two isotopes, uranium-235 and uranium-238. The 235 is the key isotope, but it occurs only seven-tenths of one percent in nature. So that's not sufficient for applying it for a power reactor. So we enrich that material, that's what we call enrichment, that's changing the isotopic mixture in, a, in the uh, material. So you want, for example, in the neighborhood of three to four percent, uranium-235 as fuel for a power reactor. So in order to enrich the material, we put it into a gaseous form. And the standard way to do this is put it in, in a gaseous form with, with fluorine, and that's uranium hexafluoride. So that gas, uh, that material will be gaseous at relatively low pressures at room temperature. So less, significantly less than one atmosphere. So here's a schematic of gas centrifuge. The one on the left shows everything together there. And you see uh, a centrifuge is basically a rotor, a thin walled hollow rotor, and it is operated inside of a casing. See the outer casing there? The outer casing is made of some strong material that will maintain a vacuum because there's a vacuum between the rotor, or inside the casing there's a vacuum, and that reduces the air drag on the rotor, which would cause heating and also it takes power to overcome that uh, rotation in the air. And so you want to maintain a, uh, a vacuum. You want the casing to be strong enough that if the centrifuge were to crash, it were to break for some reason, it contains all the material inside so no one is injured. So there's a molecular pump. You see the sketch of the, in, uh, on the left, the molecular pump at the top part of the centrifuge, and that acts to, uh, as the centrifuge is rotating, it's actually causing a pumping motion to keep the vacuum. There's a magnetic suspension at the top, and the bottom suspension is generally a needle bearing. You see that's operating uh, in the picture on the left. It's sitting on a needle that is inside some ball bearings, and the, there's an electric motor or inverter that powers the centrifuge. It, causes the rotor to spin. And the gas is removed by scoops. There's a bottom scoop and a top scoop. I'll talk more about those. But that's what's shown on the left. We have the magnetic suspension, which is lifting the rotor <clears throat> to take some of the weight of the rotor so that all of the weight is not sitting on the bottom bearing. And it also keeps it from falling over. You know, it, it holds it in place. So on the right-hand side, we see an expanded view of the centrifuge rotor. So you see what the top, the top end cap, that is the closure part of the rotor, and there's a bottom end cap to close the bottom part of the rotor. There's a baffle, and the baffle is stationary. Uh, uh, it's, I mean, ba the baffle is connected to the rotor, and it has holes in it at the top. There's a baffle at the top with holes so that the uh, gas, the uranium hexafluoride, can flow from the separating chamber, which is in the rotor, into the top end cap region. And you see there's a uh, rotor tube section at the top and a rotor tube section at the bottom. In this diagram, we show the two uh, sections of rotor connected by what's called a bellows. We'll talk more about bellows a little bit later, but you can connect different sections of rotors to, uh, with a bellows. And you see on the right-hand side, it's all put together. The bottom scoop and the top scoop are stationary. They, they do not rotate. 
and there's a, the pipe in the middle is a feed pipe. It brings the uranium hexafluoride from outside of the centrifuge into the centrifuge uh, rotor. And the top scoop and bottom scoop remove gas and take it back out. So that pipe that you see in the middle really has uh, three, there are three pipes in there. There's one for bringing in feed and two for taking out material. Here is a, just a picture of uh, centrifuge parts that were used at the University of Virginia many years ago, uh, back in the late 50s. And the one on the, the left, you see the molecular pump, and on the right, you see a, a rotor. And there's a scale at the bottom, so that, that rotor is on the order of uh, approximately a foot long. And here you see the rotor with the assembly parts. On the right hand side <clears throat> is the feed post and it has the top scoop which you see is shielded from the bottom in that picture there uh, by the baffle. And there's a bottom scoop and the, there's a top end cap at the foreground of the picture and a uh, bottom end cap on the other end. So what happens in a centrifuge? The fluid dynamics, what happens with this uranium hexafluoride is how we get the separation. Now, you know that there's a centrifugal force when something is rotating very rapidly. It's like holding a ball on a string and spinning it, then there's a force pushing that ball away from you. And that force in the, works on the isotopic mixture, and the uh, heavier isotope gets moved towards the wall, and the lighter isotope gets moved towards the rotating axis. And that's a very small separation effect, but there is enough that you take advantage of that. So that's the centrifugal separation. And that centrifugal separation then is amplified or compounded, if you will, by having a countercurrent flow. In my diagram there, <clears throat> you can see where the uh, arrows along, the, along here, the arrows are going up and down, so we have a flow in that regard like that. You can make it go either way, depending on how you control the temperature on the rotor wall. And so this, this could go in a clockwise motion or in a counterclockwise. And that just, that's something that when you build your centrifuge, you decide how you're going to do that. But if it's rotating in this direction, then this stream has more heavy isotope in it. And as it's coming up, it's getting more heavy isotope. And this stream's got light isotope and it's getting more light isotope. So in that schematic there, the bottom of the centrifuge would have would be enriched in uranium-235, the lighter isotope, and at the top it'd be enriched in uranium-238, or uh, depleted-235. So the gas, UF6 gas, enters the interior of the centrifuge from the pipe, and the gas removed with uh, more 235 at one end of the centrifuge, and more 238 at the opposite end of the centrifuge. And the gas is removed by the stationary pipes that we saw at the beginning called scoops. Now, a centrifuge, one centrifuge generally does not do what you need for your uh, production of enriched uranium, and so it doesn't get everything done in one machine. So we have to have a number of machines, and we connect the machines together uh, by piping. And they're connected in series to, mean to uh, obtain the amount of separation that you are trying to achieve. So one centrifuge might increase it by a little bit, and then the next centrifuge by a little bit more, and then a little bit more. So that's connecting in series. But you want a certain flow rate, and so you connect them in parallel to get the uh, desired fl uh, flow rate. And this arrangement is called a cascade. And so we have a, we'll talk about, uh, the concept of separative work, and that's a way to measure 
what your centrifuge is doing. And that, relate, that brings in both the flow rate and the concentration. And the separative work units are called SWUs, S-W-U. SWU generally has units, kilograms, uranium, SWU per year. So here's a picture of what I was just describing. And so you see in this cascade schematic, <clears throat> on the left-hand side we have a cylinder that contains uranium hexafluoride, and that would most likely be the uranium hexafluoride where the uh, uranium-235 is, is natural uranium, so it's like seven-tenths of one percent uh, at that point, and you heat that up, the gas goes out of the cylinder, it goes in, you have the pressure reduction, they have the correct pressure going into your centrifuge cascade. And in this picture, you see where the error is on the left-hand side, that's coming into the feed stage. In each of those rows, this row here has five centrifuges in it. This row has four centrifuges, three, two, and one. Each of those rows is called a stage. So as you go up, in this picture, the cascade, then it's being enriched in uranium-235, and as you go down the cascade, it's being depleted in 235. And then you have the gas comes out the top, gas comes out of each centrifuge and goes into the next centrifuge. So the gas coming from here is gonna go up into this stage, and gas from this stage also goes up here. Gas comes down this way and down that way. So there's a big plumbing uh, job to plumb all these things together. And then the gas is removed at the top and at the bottom and put in containers and, and transported to wherever you want to go. Now, here's a picture at the Kurchatov Institute just outside of Moscow. And this particular cascade <clears throat> is used for separating isotopes of uh, materials that have stable isotopes. This example here, they've done production of chromium-50. But these centrifuges, here's, this is centrifuges, and they're stacked up on top of one another. Uh, this building has, I think it's uh, 1,024 centrifuges, pr approximately. Here's another picture of the Kurchatov Institute centrifuges. And here's a picture of Russian uranium uh, enrichment facility. And you see how they stacked. In this picture, you see four levels of centrifuges. So instead of making a centrifuge very long, they stack them up in their buildings. And you see lots of pipes. And so it's a, a short, these are short centrifuges, but there's many, many of them in order to achieve what uh, desired flow rate and concentration. This is a picture of centrifuges in Almelo, which is in the Netherlands. Uh, these centrifuges are operated by Urenco. And you can see at the top, there's a lot of piping. You can see the piping a little bit better here. And that's the piping bringing all the, the gas into the centri each centrifuge and taking it out of the centrifuges. So those pipes are, uh, there's, a, there's a feed header and there's a product header and so forth. So they're all connected together. Now, you saw the picture I just showed you. There's no one in the building there to see how tall these are. Uh, so, but you could get, make some estimates. In this case here, it's a little more obvious. I think these are really tall centrifuges. These are American centrifuges. And these were deployed in Piketon, Ohio, in a gas centrifuge plant that the U.S. government never completed and other pictures of United States centrifuges. So that's the an introductory uh, lecture on gas centrifuges and components of what's inside a given centrifuge and how you connect centrifuges together to form a cascade.